I'm Michael Altendorf, the founder of Intelligence. Um, we are happy to um, have a lot of our clients, partners and friends here uh, in that workshop about next big things in internet technology, though we did not just want to do a sales pitch, we thought about it's much cooler to learn more about the next big things and what's coming up. Uh, we think that uh, mobile search, personalization, big data and uh, video on demand is definitely a big thing. And um, we invited speakers from all the different topics to talk about that. And they, they're coming one by one, every ten, each in 10 minutes. So we have normally, if it's a bit, we are good in time, we always can have some questions, but otherwise we do the questions afterwards. So what is intelligence doing? So we are providing the leading technology platform for the personalized web. Uh, we think that personalized web doesn't mean only uh, websites or e-commerce shops, but especially everything which has sensors, your home, your car. Um, also, um, you can do predictive health with uh, checking your health with different sensors and uh, therefore you need a lot of machine learning and um, you need a lot of targeting because otherwise you get overwhelmed of all the data you have so and you can see it on your mobile you need to make it fit just for you um, we started uh, in 2009 we worked at SAP before we are now more than 75 people and um, from diverse software companies and media companies uh, we did several angel rounds and we um, have offices all around um, Europe and uh, also in uh, New York we started and a small office in Silicon Valley where we sent some uh, developers from uh, Germany to get this kind of spirit and injection. Uh, we are just uh, also got announced as technology pioneer for the World Economic Forum so this is also really nice and uh, helps a lot uh, growing the business as now the, with a the big data trend and all that stuff it's really clear that uh, personalization is a, a big topic. So we also have partners all around the world. We started just in Europe, but um, we got a lot of feedback and a lot of requests by partners from uh, in Tokyo, in Dubai, in Argentina to also start businesses there. And we are also happy to speak about potential partner opportunities later on. And now, what are the next big things in internet technology? The core trend uh, we see is definitely the big data. Big data is um, really obvious stuff you already have in your e-commerce shop uh, or you're on your website. You have CRM data, you have BI data, you have a lot of product information, you have um, marketing channel data from diverse marketing channels starting with, oh yeah, there is Facebook and you have the whole user profile, you know everything about the user, but on the other hand you have um, things like uh, search data which is really close to the next call to action or the next purchase. Now mobile data is becoming really an obvious thing but nobody is really using that. So there we can really do a lot of things and what you do know from how Google is doing it, they have a lot of semantic web uh, approach, semantic web databases and call it the knowledge graph which is in the end the interest and keywords you type in, you have the social graph, which is uh, what you can see on Facebook, what your friends like, what you like, and Facebook, is, that you can see here, uh, Facebook um, is providing that new kind of semantic search, where they have search correlated databases, then you have uh, the product graph from, from the shops, and if you correlate all together, that is what makes the difference. And it's also the complex thing, because the data is so unstructured in different kind of data pools. But the next thing we see is that uh, the mobile trend is uh, really changing the game. And we can see in the eyes of the clients, and it was just downstairs at the panel, that, okay, what to do on mobile? There are a lot of strategies, a lot of ideas, but we think that mobile is not that trend. It's that we use different screens, different screen sizes. The smartphone, when you are out, um, you need totally different search results, totally different recommendations. For example, if you fly, going to the airport, where is the gate, where is the parking lot, if you're using a tablet, it's more about shopping and browsing and information retrieval. If it's desktop, it's a lot about work and um, typing in stuff. And if you are on the TV, it's a lot about entertaining. And we hear also from Fuster about video on demand. As we see the TV, the next thing where the operating system comes in. And if you then see the Google Class, 
what is announced and in the PR and the press since more than a year, if it comes up, we definitely think that this is changing the game another time. And also these kind of new watches, which, which are at the moment really famous, let's see how that goes. And personalization you need for everything. Um, because if you have all that data points and all the different devices, but the data has to be shrinked and made tailored just for you. If you take the different kind of device, uh, data you can have from media from this year and what you have today, it's not about the data what you get from Google Class that you can record your life. It's just what you have now. If you use that, you can make already a change and make it usable, uh, playing it out on the different devices. And um, then we make that uplift of 30, 50% if we integrate in some e-commerce shops. I think that for e-commerce, it's really the obvious case. That's why we also have some speakers from um, e-commerce where you can really see with personalization that if you get to see what you wanted to have, then you make the conversion and that is how, how it works in the end. And where you get a really fast uplift. And I'm happy to give over to Alberto Sanz, uh, CEO of Autoscout, to show us the next digitalizing service garage. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everybody. So, I'm representing Autoscout24, which is probably a dinosaur in the internet. Uh, we are 15 years old, and we are Europe's number one marketplace for the automotive sector. Now, we look younger, and we try to keep young, and that's why I was able to answer the question Michael asked me, hey, do you guys have anything new to talk about that would be worth mentioning? I said, yes, this time we have something, which is talking about how to enter a market that is yet not in the internet, which is the garage service industry. I know this is not a very sexy industry per se, but it is a very interesting industry. And let me very briefly give you our thoughts on you know, how that industry looks like and uh, what, what we believe we can achieve with, that, uh, with bringing that industry from the Stone Age into the year 2013. So, what, what, what is the situation today? If I ask you, who has not felt ripped off when he had brought his car to a garage and was getting a price ticket? Probably many people would say, oof, I never felt really, really comfortable. I didn't know if I was paying too much, if I was getting too many services, and things got repaired or replaced that didn't have to get replaced. And that is, a, is an insight that's not very, you know, not very new. This is a reality we are facing since many years. Also, we, we don't have the clarity beyond knowing where is the next garage. This is something we can find in the internet. But beyond where is the next garage, we don't know anything about are we paying the right price, getting the right product, and this is a trustworthy garage where I'm bringing my car. And I'm asked, you know, who cares? And I say, do you care whether you buy a car, sorry, a, a, for example, a, a digital camera in one shop or the other? They say no, because it's the same digital camera. When I say, do you care if they repair your car properly and you have good brakes, or your brakes don't work and you're with your family in the car, people say, well, I actually do care, but I never thought about it because I can't really check it. So there is an insight around consumers. And if you look at the other side, which are the garages themselves, they are somewhere really far away from the internet world. There are very few garages that have a homepage. And if you look at the homepage, it's somewhere from the 80s and wasn't touched again. You know, they haven't been able to see what is the value in there. So where the garages are spending their money is typically in yellow pages. And yellow pages, I can say for Germany, they spend a couple of thousand euros a year for the yellow pages for two liners in a yellow page book. That's marketing of garages very often. So that's a situation where they're overwhelmed what is coming in terms of internet and they don't know how to handle that. And the other challenge is the loyalty of consumers of garages is decreasing over time because consumers are getting informed on the internet where is a garage. There's not much more information, but they get informed. And they start losing those clients that go to the garage just because it's next door, or it's the neighbor's friend who's in the garage. So they're exposed to some challenges. So what we said is, let's do something that doesn't exist. Which is, we did it under our Autoscout24 brand, we created the garage portal, which essentially is very simple from an end consumer point of view. You say which car I make, you, make and model you have, how old is the car, and what's the mileage? And where are you? That's all we need. 
And in the back side, we have a very complex calculation which grabs the information, I mean, not grabs, we has the information from all the car providers and tells you, okay, for this specific car, I make a calculation and you need this specific service. And we say exactly what is the OEM imposed service for this car at that point in time. And with that and the information we have from the garages, we create a binding offer. So what happens is the service is specific and described and there is a price. So suddenly you are able to compare services. So if you do a car inspection and it costs you around 400 euro, many people want to save money. And if you can save up to 100 euro with good conscience that you get the right service, that is something people value. And it is a binding offer you generate with that. So <clears throat> suddenly you empower the end consumer and make him feel comfortable about his decision. And finally, what we're also doing is we are, because we have transactions here, this is not a classifieds model, it's a transaction-based model, uh, we get ratings from the consumers. So people start understanding the price is good, the quality is good, and service in general is good. On the garage side, what happens is that suddenly somebody cares about their internet presence. So with being with that platform, they suddenly have an a, 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 a internet visit card, we call it, you know, with all the information, all the services they offer, and they get the right clients at the right point in time. And suddenly they are competing in the same uh, playing level field. And a garage which is somewhere in the woods can compete with a garage which is on the main street, which he couldn't in the past. Or an expensive garage which typically started losing clients as the car got older and people got more price sensitive can react and give better prices to older cars. So suddenly there is a much more targeted tool. And that's basically the, the idea behind the, uh, the garage portal. And this is something we haven't found yet in, in any country we have looked at. There are listing models where people just write the address of a garage. There are systems where you can describe your car issue and wait for an email from a garage portal. You'll have to wait very long. This is not very 2030-ish kind of user experience. So the ability of calculating the price becomes really a, an advantage. Now, just to give you a bit of a sense, what, what's the opportunity? Is this a big thing or a small thing? Well, the, I mean, I'm talking here German numbers, but the analogy for other countries works as well. The business of garage service is a 30 billion market in Germany. It's about half the volume, half the business of the used car business. We're 15 years in the used car business, and now we're saying, hey, there is a half-sized business, we should be thinking about it. So that's a big thing. There are around 40,000 garages in Germany, and there is no competition offering something like that. So we said, that sounds, feels like a sweet spot. The business model is simple, the garage pays a fixed fee, and then per transaction they would be sharing part of their revenues. It's a very simple model. And, and where are we to close? Um, Basically, we are one year since national rollout, so we were able to acquire 10% of all the garages. These are paying clients. This is, sounds maybe small, but it's not small because this is a tough market. There's no surprise this is not in the internet because these clients don't fully understand the power of internet. So there's a very uh, uh, direct sales conversation you have to have with all these garages. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough entry. Uh, we generate around 60 views per garage per month. Uh, bookings growing rapidly. And uh, the ratings, which is a good news, we, would have, we were thinking the garage would be getting very bad ratings uh, from, from the consumers. Now, consumers are not ex clearly you know, saying the service, the quality of the technical change was good or so. What they rate is their impression. And what we see here is their impression is 4.3 from a rating of 5 as a maximum, is very good. So we were very happy, and our garages are very happy. And suddenly, because they are aware of the, of the of reputation of garages, okay, suddenly they realize having a reputation in the internet is helpful. So it all plays very well together. And the final remark, confirming to us beyond the numbers and the continued growth that there's something onto it, is we feel like Winnie the Pooh putting his hand in the, in the bee house. Okay, so we are getting into the honey, and suddenly, as we put the fingers in the honey, there are so many bees hitting us from all sides because we found a sweet spot. Because that is where the big margins are done in the car industry. When you sell a car today, you basically do very little margin. 
as a, as a dealer, okay? Because you count on the service business to generate revenues over the next three, four, five years for a new car. Then as a dealership, you start losing these clients. And as a sum, that works out, and that is where the money is. So as we offer a good value, we believe it's fair to take part of this honey, and uh, that was what I wanted to tell you. Basically, still in 2013, there are industries which are not in the internet. It's not necessarily easy. You have to be able to invest time and explain the internet to those people still in the stone age of the internet. So it's an uphill thing, but we think it's worth going for it. So I hope it inspires you to think of other industries where even if it's uphill, it's nice up there on the top. And uh, if there are any questions now or later, please let me know. Thank you. This one is not working. No. Hello? Uh, my name is Jean-Laurent Watton. I'm co-founder of a very early stage mobile game company. And today I'm going to tell you about how to drastically, quite impressively, I hope, increase your conversion, virality, and retention. I hope I'm not overselling it, and I hope it will be useful. Next. So, I'm going to use two use cases here from the gaming space. The most used one will be about Pretty Simple, which their game Criminal Case, and a little bit of Social Point with their game Dragon City. Both companies and both games are very successful. We're talking eight, nine, 10 million daily active users, so pretty large. Does it work? No? Okay. So a little bit about me quickly. I'm, I'm really passionate about growth and scalability. Uh, 1999, I joined a startup a long time ago, and I got this virus. We started about three, four, a handful of people, uh, and it grew to 100 people in about a year and a half. So pretty impressive, loved it, kept the virus with me. A few years later, I joined Google as sales engineer and team lead, and I was meeting the direct clients, helping them at the time, to optimize the landing page and the funnel. Not that we, it was called like this at the time, but that was in effect what I was doing, using Google Analytics, using Google Maps, SEO, and so on. And then I joined Badu as Director of Performance Marketing, where I was in charge of acquiring very large amount of users on a very tight ROI, and also put in place the first business intelligence. Same thing for Social Point, a gaming company, where I came in to hire, to acquire a large amount of users, again, very tight ROI, and grow the business intelligence, the analytics side of the business. And then the rest is my new venture. So let's start with conversion. One of the golden rules in free-to-play games is to make sure that in the first session, your player is going to invite friends. If not in the first session, there's a big risk that you're going to have a drop-off, and of course, they're not going to invite anyone. So let's see how you do that. Ideally, your first session will look like this. Someone joins, have fun, and then more fun, and then more fun. And at some point, you can hint like, you should invite your friends. But usually, it's not exactly like this. You have a few hurdles. You have some fun, but you have things such as slow service, confusing user interface, and technical issues. Of course, that adds to the drop-off, to the leakage of users, that things you want to fix. So if things, in terms of slow service, for example, look at this one, it's a game which is nearly 800 megabytes. This needs to be downloaded on Wi-Fi. You cannot download it on 3G. It's also quite long. By the time someone downloads it, there's a chance he forgot about it. So whether it's very large, very heavy HTML5 pages, or very heavy apps. Think, try to optimize, try to have downloads that come after the initial downloads. In terms of the UI, there's no, real, there's no real secret here. You have to test and test and test again. The one thing which is really important, and that's a golden rule in testing, never help the tester. See what he's doing, see where he's making mistakes, see where he's getting confused, but do not help him at any time. This is also very important 
when you transfer a desktop game with large real estate to a mobile game, which is much more difficult, much more cumbersome for the users to understand. Here again, that's an example from a social point. There were a lot of iterations to get it right. And in terms of technical issues, again, there's no secret here. You have to track every click possible. You have to really, really see, look over the shoulders of each of your users, observe where the drops happen, find the problems, and of course, fix it. And this is something that Criminal Case did for six months. They spent 30% of their development time on this, on the tutorial, making an, an explanation of what the game is about, and on the first time user experience. So it's a lot of hard work, but it's one of the, the most important. You paid for users, you've got them through virality, you want them to play your game and to invite other people. Now, in terms of virality, the golden rule is you have to think it from the beginning. You can't add it as, as, as an extra afterwards. You have to think it within the game and make it part of the game. And of course, when you talk about virality, it's always synonymous of Facebook. So here's an example of Dragon City where people who connect with Facebook will get an extra gift. And people who will later on in the game log in with Facebook will have access to some features which are limited to Facebook connected users. So it's, it's an incentive for people to log in and then you can start the virality process. So what makes people invite? It's a good reason at the right time and making it easy for the users to invite. So let's look at what Criminal Case did. Criminal Case lets you play, lets you enjoy, lets you want to continue, and then at some point puts a stopper and say, hey, sorry, you're running low on energy. So of course it, it, it drives frustration, but you can buy some energy or you can invite your friends for free. And here, look at the screen, it's pretty clean. You can see all your friends pre-selected. You can deselect some, you can see the progress bar at the top, and you've got a nice green button that you cannot miss. They're making it very easy for the users. The second thing, so invite, in, in, invite like I showed just prior, drove about 50% of the virality. The other 50% came from the open graph stories. Open graph stories are automatically posted on Facebook, on the feed, and your friends can see what you're up to. This drove another 50%, and it went up to 160,000 installed per day. This is purely organic. There's no paid, it's pretty massive. More than half a million every day installs. Then, in terms of retention, here again, the rule is users come back because they get a request or a notification from the game. So do as much you can for this. So the best request you can get, and I'm sure we're all used to this, is to get free stuff. So here again, pretty simple, offers to users to send gifts to their friends, free gifts. And you see here the same user interface, very simple, sent to the users. Guess what? I receive a free gift, I log back in, and I increase the retention rate. Another, another way to uh, retain users is in criminal case, you've got those um, activities that take time and happen in the background. So what they did is that as soon as an activity finished, add, add a um, app notification with a very clear call to action, go get the results now, cannot be clearer. And this app notification style got half a million click every day with a stunning click rate of 29%. It's a pretty good job. The result in terms of uh, retentions are pretty impressive too. People who logged in came back the day after, one out of two. People who came back day seven, nearly 40%. This is pretty massive in gaming. So in conclusion, a pretty simple criminal case grew from zero to 
to 9 million daily active users in six months. And they managed to create this very nice loop where players come back on day one because they receive a free gift, retention, from friends they invited the day before, virality. And then this loop goes on, on, and on. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much. So my name is Andreas Schrader, and I'm kind of in charge of growing Odigeo, which is Europe's biggest e-commerce business and the world's biggest online flight retailer. We are operating under four or five brands that you possibly know, where we are not operating as Odigeo, but under Opodo, GoVoyage, eDreams, Travelink, and Liligo. But today I'm not here to speak about Odigeo, but about something that I'm excited about, that is close to what we are doing here. An opportunity, again, to bring something online that today is not. And that is destination services. That's a market that so far is unviable and where I think we are now at a stage that we can develop that market and bring it online. Any idea what this number is? Or how to spell it? <laughs> It's three and a half trillion dollars, and that's the size of the travel industry. So the travel industry is the second largest after the food industry worldwide, and a significant part of that is not yet online. If you look at it, if you look at it a bit closer, then we can see that kind of uh, there are two to three rather familiar products: uh, lodging, flights, and cars uh, that are quite popular online. That together form roughly 40% of the travel industry. And the rest is food, transit, activities, in destination retail. So that's a significant part of the business and that usually is not even considered when, when looking at travel. So if we look at only that part, which is in destination spend, then we're still talking about 2.1 trillion US dollars a year. And now look at what is online, or what kind of is an online spend. The same circle, and you see kind of lodging, flights, and cars, and there are at least significant parts of that and which are sold or transacted online. If you now come to the other categories, food, transit, activities, you hardly see that there is anything online. Possibly food, which is kind of a bit of restaurant booking, where there are some transactions online, but most of that is still an offline world. So roughly two trillion of euros uh, of dollars a year that are not yet online. This is what we think is the potential uh, that you can get online. You will not get every tour, transfer, restaurant booking uh, in destination online. Obviously, uh, that may by category between 10 to 15 or 20 percent. But we think like the opportunity here is uh, still 280 billion dollars a year. And why is that not online? The, the, the key reason for that is in-destination services are bought in destination. And the reason is why, because people in the beginning don't know when exactly they are after what. And on top of that, there is little incentive to book an excursion, whereas excess inventory, kind of where you can go and step on a bus at whatever time without any limitation, why you should book it in advance usually. So people are not thinking about uh, booking anything ahead of their travel. They are thinking about doing something when they are in the destination and then they are on top of that in spending mode. Well, before traveling, they are usually in savings mode, trying to get the cheapest uh, flight, the best deal for the hotel. Once they are there or once they are traveling, they are kind of changing mood and are rather willing to spend for service and quality. So. People are kind of willing to spend in destination, but then they are not online. Well, they used to be offline in, in destinations. And because there was kind of no 
relevant online demand, there was also no incentive to aggregate the supply. And from surf classes to red buses to restaurants, there is a vast number of, of, of businesses that are all kind of not integrated anywhere, not even listed in, 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 in classifieds or online classifieds and uh, even the less transactable. So that is something where kind of there is no relevant aggregation in this fragmented industry. And hence, there is no relevant online supply that you could distribute, and if there is no supply to distribute, then there is no distributor either. All of this is now changing. Thanks to mobile, travelers are now online in destination. There are still some limitations uh, due to roaming charges and, and uh, people who have insufficient smartphones uh, that are not really uh, usable for, for informing themselves and transacting anything online. But that is a diminishing limitation. So kind of people are now increasingly online in their destination. And that already led to businesses popping up to, to aggregate content in destination. So there is now an increasing number of uh, offers uh, that are interesting for, for travelers during their travel that are transactable online. Most of them are transactable only up to 24 hours before you use it, which is not a very useful case uh, because uh, spontaneous uh, shopping in destination doesn't work with more than 24 hours anticipation. But that is something that can be overcome. So supply is now becoming available and is becoming now available to consumers through mobile. So is this now a viable market for that? It's not. And it is not because we have a mobile marketing challenge. We now may have supply, and supply is growing, and let's assume for a moment that supply is no longer a point of concern. Then it is still an unviable market because you cannot reach out to consumers in that way while they are traveling. People are not used to search anything online while being in the destination. So people don't search for in-destination content. That's the first limitation. So what, whatever business is online today, most start with people searching for something and then you support and you serve to that search. But if people are not used to search, kind of how do you get the trigger? Well, you could take the other way around and say kind of we know, since we have sold a flight, that this person is in a destination. So you could kind of take everything we have, be it restaurants, surfing classes, uh, red buses, whatever, and bombard our users or our customers with offers for that destination so that they can choose. But people are not really interested in being spammed while in destination. So that's kind of killing the travel experience. So you do not really get to them with, with, with that type of, of advertising. The alternative to that is kind of to become more intelligent, but people then feel traced and, 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 and uh, consider advertising to be creepy in a way that if you have kind of traced them here and there and therefore come up with something that is uh, kind of tailored to their needs, uh, then they don't understand uh, that this is something that is legitimate. And in all that difficulty in reaching out to, to consumers while they are traveling, you also have to take into account that each single transaction, uh, a red bus ticket for 20 euros or a restaurant for 60 euros or a surfing class for 50 euros, that's all small ticket sale in a way. If you have a 10% margin over that, and that is not a good reason to lose your customer or your customer's brand preference just in order to drive one more transaction or possibly drive one more transaction. So kind of you need to be really careful about advertising mobile in destination in during travel. So that's quite, quite, quite a challenge uh, which today makes this market not yet easily viable. So we do have a to-do list. And Odigio is one who's after that market. But I think there are a few others who, who see that opportunity and uh, who are, are working on, on, on these fields. And it is something that I find exciting because it is 
a couple of technologies, techniques, and that we are developing anyway in order to deal intelligently with our customers and make good offers and good proposals to, to our customers that in this particular market are essential and are kind of the, the prerequisite of having a market at all. The first is kind of to understand a customer's multi-channel behavior. So that is already starting with a challenge to link between someone who has kind of booked a flight or on a, on a, on a desktop computer while he was in his office and then complemented that with a hotel booking that possibly his wife did while at home on, 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 on the laptop. And you now kind of have that particular traveler uh, on, 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 on his trip with a smartphone and all that kind of is a, is a behavior of one, possibly even two people who form an entity that you have to understand. So multi-channel behavior uh, and, and understanding that is, is the first to do. And then it is about kind of a user's reaction to proposals that you make to him while he's traveling, so mobile proposals. The tolerance to, to be kind of exposed to offers is very different by person and by situation. And you can learn from people in the way how they react to it. If they kind of are open to be kind of inspired uh, and, and be exposed to more choice or if they really kind of are only reacting if something is really meeting the point exactly. And if people are more afraid of being kind of uh, traced and addressed as a person, as an individual, or if people kind of are less concerned about that. So all that is stuff that you can and have to learn. Then understanding the current user situation perfectly. That is, if, for instance, you know about <coughs> there is a flight uh, with a layover and the the, the onto flight is delayed for weather reasons or whatever, then it may be an interesting offer to offer three or four hours in a hotel at a decent price uh, in the hotel within the airport. If someone kind of has experienced two days of rain with his family in, in a vacation on Barcelona, uh, he may be open to have an offer for an aquarium where he can go with his children. That not may not be interesting or relevant if the weather would be different. So you have to really understand uh, what it is kind of that uh, the user is in and the entire situation, including all parameters that you can get your hands on to select the right offer, the right message and prioritize your communication right. And then you have to merchandise in a way that turns promotion into service. So people kind of understand that someone thought about their trip and makes an effort to make it easier. So if we understand, for instance, that someone is on a business trip and that he has a connecting flight and that his connection is unsecure because of bad weather, say in Frankfurt or in London, where he has a stopover and we can recommend him another route, so a rebooking that makes sure that he will arrive on time, then this is something that for a business traveler is an appreciated service. Whereas for a budget traveler, this may not be relevant at all and therefore kind of shouldn't be brought up. All that kind of is now on our to-do list. So understanding multi-channel, understanding behavior, understanding the, the situation of a traveler and, and merchandise uh, promotions as a service. Luckily, kind of that to-do list corresponds pretty well to a couple of technologies and, and uh, developments that we do are, uh, do propose and, and, and develop in-house that are starting with customer relationship management, uh, behavioral targeting and, and big data development complemented with multi-channel management, supply aggregation which is kind of making the long tail products available and, and, and addressable and itinerary management. The last is kind of for us a key in bringing the different pieces together and that we kind of understand not only a booking but a trip and that we understand kind of how to address a, a user while he's traveling in his situations and be useful uh, instead of pushy on, 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 on transactions. So that's kind of a, a couple of technologies and projects and that we drive internally that all kind of have their individual purposes but all together unlock this market. And now comes the good thing that the situation that we are addressing while someone is traveling 
is not so much different to an everyday situation at home. People are kind of starting to no longer be travelers, but to be mobile. So in that sense, the, the border between travel and non-travel industry, between food and restaurant during travel, all of that is blurring in a way, and uh, that kind of makes that for one travel situation that you have, you may have 10 at home, dis at home situations that you can address in the similar way. And that makes that even if the, 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 the addressable market for online transactions for in-destination is roughly 280 billion, then it is kind of the same that you can earn with this type of services in commissions because if you have 10% commission and average on that and 10 times as many situations to address as you have during travel, then you end again on the 280 billion. So that's a quite substantial market, and I'm pretty sure that we are not the only ones who are after it. Uh, I'm at the same time pretty sure that users are not after having 10 solutions in their pocket. So most likely people will not use 8 hotel apps, 12 airline apps, uh, five rental car apps, uh, five taxi apps and whatsoever. So that is something that in the beginning is an accepted pattern and people may be even excited about having different apps and webs and providers. But over time, they are after convenience and after getting that integrated. So the challenge is kind of to be intelligent in bringing the pieces together to really have the full spectrum of services, have a good understanding and have an intelligent communication to the customer and uh, to, to, to bring that all uh, to relevance uh, at the moment of truth, which is during travel. So that was the opportunity that I wanted to share and invite you to go after whenever you have time. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Don't fall asleep in the, in the last line. So, um, my name is Stefan Lengin. I'm um, leading the European expansion at Intelligence. And um, yes, I want to talk to you um, about colonization and uh, how you can make money out of it. So, um, yeah, this slide. Um, so, we, we are the one who can increase revenues for our clients with personalization. And um, yes, we think uh, the future of marketing will be personalized. So um, 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 there are different stages in evolution. So the first three stages are currently standard or mostly standard. So um, everybody is doing site analysis and also uh, do site and ad optimization. Most of e-commerce shops or e-businesses do multiple testing. Um, some of them are also um, automated. But what we do, and we developed a, um, a really, really strong tool, we call it Commerce Plus. Um, we developed it um, during the last three years. What we do is, is, is really much, much more than, than uh, what the current market standard is. So we, we um, deliver design, content, and, and product um, based on profile parameters. So if you, if you are 24, interested in football, come to the site, then you see probably a different site in comparison to um, a female interested in, in, in fashion and, and 30 years old. So, and we can, um, we do this automated and with machine learning. So the machine is learning day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And these learnings then, and the machine consider then these learnings for every new contact um, with every new um, visitor. And um, 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 in, in, in time of, of, of really strong mobile um, devices, we can do this also optimized for all devices. So you see a different application or website if you join or visit via iPad in comparison to a mobile phone. Or also in comparison if you go um, on the website um, at home or um, during a business travel. So what is um, uh, what we try to achieve with this? So first, we want to make people's lives easier and more comfortable. So um, um, because imagine, so 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 you don't need to search for products; you immediately find them because they are already there. So you're looking for trousers, then we present you the trousers in the right size and the color you probably want to have. 
So this is this is so this makes really the life easier and more comfortable. Um, as Michael also told you, if you go to the airport, then we can show you the gate, what is right for you, even if the change, or um, probably your alarm clock is ringing earlier because there's a storm. Um, um, there was a storm during the night, and so um, um, we know that that you need to stand up earlier to to get your train to the to to, to your job. So, um, but of course, now there's an. Of course, we also um, need to make money, uh, especially uh, because of the clients um, uh, we are working for. So. Um, Yes, uh, um, it, is, it is all about relevance, so relevance counts. So if you, if you um, provide information um, which are more relevant to your potential clients or to your customers, then the conversion will be higher, and then the conversion rates will be higher, and then this will equal to, uh, uh, to higher revenues. So this is the, the, the basis um, of our work, and um, there are massive uplets uh, possible. So we're talking about 50%, in some cases over 50%. We had, we had also clients with 150%. It really depends in which kind of situation you are, in which kind of situation the, the shop is, what kind of optimized or optimization measures you already do or did, and then um, um, it is really uh, depending on this basis, and then um, um, uh, we, can, um, we will achieve um, um, this kind of uplift. But... Um, just to say, since the last um, release in, in February, um, in average, um, um, over all our clients, we um, could generate 90% uplift in conversion rate over all our clients. So please imagine, you spend 1 million euro in Google, then probably you will generate 10 million revenue out of it. And we can make, um, um, we can, we can, um, make out of the 10 million revenue, we can make 12 million. So this, this is really massive. And we have a performance-based model, so we, we, we just participate on the uplift. So really interesting and uh, really interesting pitch, I would say. So um, let's have a look at a yeah, typical customer journey. So you probably um, visit Facebook with your um, um, mobile phone at home, and um, we know um, of your interest, um, you're probably interested in fashion or you have other interests. And our machine um, um, presents you then a tailored website or a tailored application. Tailored for this specific situation. You're at home, we know your interest, we know that you're coming from Facebook, and you do this via smartphone. Probably a completely different website or app if you join it via iPad and come from Google, because then probably we will have less information. Um, but um, yes, so this is, this is and it is it's tested and optimized um, um, the whole, um, yeah, every minute. Yes, data. Um, every time I present this, uh, this case and then, then clients ask me or, 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 or um, um, customers ask me, so, and the data? Where does the data come from? So Google, if you, if you join via Google, then, then you just have the keyword. And, um, but um, as Michael also told you, um, the data is already there. So probably you have tons of data, but you don't use it. You have session data, so session trackings. You have probably buying history. You have logging data from your customers if they need to log in. Um, then you have data from all your campaigns post-campaign data, um, retargeting data, and this data is already there, but currently there is no other machine who can really match these different types of data and can let follow actions out of it. So, and, and um, our machine can do this. Convert Plus can match any data in real time. So, for example, we use Google as a traffic source, then we add location parameters, we add weather parameters, we probably use post-campaign data, so we know if the visitor who clicks on a Google ad was already there before or not. So, and these information or these attributes 
uh, uh, yeah, we, we with the click, we, we got this information. And then the website um, um, is creating in real time a personalized uh, version. On the other side, we, we got a link to the, to the product feed. And so also the product feed rearranges um, um, with every visit. So just um, to give you an example, but sometimes um, um, people are not, not really understanding it. <laughs> so I, I really um, downsize uh, um, um, the level a bit and, and want to make it as simple as I can. So um, you see, um, Steve wants to um, buy a product. And he comes to a website. And um, um, his profile parameters, he's 24 years old, interesting in football, he is male, and the sun is shining. So he sees a website, um, um, generic website. Every, everybody sees this website. And um, you see um, yeah, mainly women's shoes. So um, not the best fit, I would say. And what we do is we can tailor all elements of the website. So personal product recommendation, um, then tailored design, um, a filtered product feed. So the, 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 the website really could look like this. And, um, but it could also could be a completely different website uh, tomorrow. The same guy is, is logging in, but then, I don't know, via Facebook and via iPad, and it is raining outside. So probably, um, yeah, the design is completely different because the design for this day um, um, promises uh, higher conversion rates. So we think that, that yeah, different people should have different websites. Because if, if you go to an, an offline store, um, if, you, if, you, if you have the chance to get a really good salesperson, then he will treat you different in comparison to other um, um, customers. Because you're male and not female, because you are older and, and, and the other customer is younger, so he will treat you different. And this is why um, uh, he, he can make mana, money and, and sell you uh, products. So just to give you an, kind of um, yeah, some, some numbers, what, what, the, what this really means. This is, this is a case um, um, we did for Barmenia Insurance. Um, um, and um, we, um, we optimized um, the, the Google AdWords campaigns with um, personalized um, websites. Just for two healthcare products and just for Google and just, I think it was 500 keywords, takes more than 6,000 um, different variations. So and this, is, is just, uh, this needs to be done automatically because you can't handle this, um, handle this uh, manually. And um, I can also give you another example. So if you, if you probably have an, um, running an e-commerce shop and, and you, you have 50,000 um, 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 keywords, probably 2,000 keywords um, are responsible for 70% of your revenue. And for these 2,000 keywords, you probably optimize manually or semi-manually um, 200 to 300 different um, uh, landing pages. We do this for all 50K keywords, and we can do this per keyword. If the traffic is high enough, we can do this per keyword, and, 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 and we, um, we, we know and we can prove that um, and there will be an impact on conversion rate, a positive impact of, on conversion rate. So this is an, an example um, we did for Trust for Less, um, or the project, um, um, presentation project we run for Trust for Less. Um, um, yes, there's a Facebook campaign, then we have um, different product categories, and then this comes out to 10,000 different variations. So, um, yes, I can't talk about figures and about conversion rates, um, but, um, you know, really, um, um, a lot of clients trust us, um, um, and, and I, I promise you, we, we really lead them to success. And um, as you can imagine, if you probably have 10 million or 20 million or 30 million revenue uh, you're doing with your platform, then 10% is really a massive uplift in, 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 in revenue. So um, um, it, it really um, makes sense to think about um, to use um, um for your platform. 
Yes, just as a summary, as a, as a short wrap up, um, what we do, we aggregate the data out of different sources. Um, most of our programmers are coming from, from SAP, so they, they, are, they are worked for business, uh, business objects, developing um, business objects, so they are used to match data out of different sources and, and, and that actions follow. So this is, this is their, their, their core knowledge. So what we do is, um, we, we do this, so we grab data from, or we don't grab it, we, we use data, which is already there, from Google, from SAP CM system, from um, uh, CMS system. And um, then um, we um, send it through the personalization cloud. Um, so we um, match the data and then we cluster it and then um, we um, generate a personalized um, front end um, per uh, device. And yes, this then leads to an, an uplift of 30 to 50% in average. Thank you very much. If you have um, questions or you need additional information, um, I'm um, here for you at the booth down tight. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm Giro Graf, I'm heading the Google Plus development team in Europe. And everything which you just heard from Stefan about how you can actually personalize a website is very much in line with what we try to achieve also with Google Plus and Google properties in general. And I'll show you a little bit about this in this presentation and I hope um, it's, it, it makes all the strategy behind one Google much clearer to the audience here. Because before I start with the presentation, I'll give you a little bit of story. We ourselves, uh, one and a half years ago, had a pretty, pretty big problem ourselves when it comes down to signing in and logging into an experience on Google. We had 17 different logins uh, across all Google products, on YouTube, on Google Search, on Google Maps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Larry came on board as CEO again, and he said we want to have one experience across Google properties. So when you have a Gmail account today or a YouTube account today, you will realize that when you try to log in, you will just see this very beautiful little uh, design feature where it says sign in with your Google account. Don't sign in with YouTube, don't sign in with Google Plus, with Google Search, etc. Just have one Google account in your, at your disposal. And we launched this Google Plus sign in functionality across everything in Google um, in February 2013. And now we actually open it also up to the World Wide Web, so to speak. Um, ever since, we have 47 partners implemented in Europe, amongst those the top startups and bigger corporates as well, like SoundCloud, The Guardian here in, uh, in the UK, Deezer, the French Spotify, so to speak. Uh, all of them are now enabled with Google Plus sign-in. And what we believe in is that we're living in a cross-device world, right? So next to that you can lower the threshold of one identity across the web, the World Wide Web, is not only about you being one identifiable user on the website, it's also you being identifiable across platforms. So no matter if you're on iOS, Android, on the website, on the mobile website for this particular company, you want to be the same identifiable user or the companies want to understand that this is the same user which came back from the website or from the mobile web. So this is just a, a very short uh, uh, slide on how much interaction there is going on between these devices. So a lot of people nowadays, and this is very much common sense, are using different devices throughout the day at the same time. And you as a company, if you're interested, you want to actually target them as most relevant as possi possible and give them a seamless experience across properties. The challenges here were that everything you've done before were pretty much siloed, right? Yesterday it was cookies. Today, it's pretty much, you have different identifiers, no matter if it's on the website, if it's on Android, iOS, etc. It was siloed. You couldn't really track one particular person. So you need a single identity across. And this cross-device identity provider could be the Google Plus sign-in. Um, and even more so, um, first of all, obviously, there are hundreds of millions of Gmail users, hundreds of millions of YouTube users, etc. So you could already tap into this. But Second of all, um, we have obviously Android as well. So if you think about tight integrations with Android, this can be a huge potential for every company who wants to drive their users from the website to the mobile versions, so to speak. 
and as easy as possible, right? Not to get them to the Play Store to find the apps in the Play Store, but to pick them up at the most relevant moment for them when they try to sign into the website. And this is, as I said before, across everything you do about Google, right? So your chance, if the people sign in with Google onto your, onto your websites, you will actually get the benefits to also be discoverable in the future, and I can't say exactly where now, but it's gonna come across YouTube, across search. Android, as I said before, is already there. Uh, Gmail, wallet in the US, UK, um, and also Google Play, as I mentioned before. So very quickly, just the product walkthrough so you understand what I'm talking about, because sometimes uh, it's really hard if you don't see an example. Fandango is one of our partners in the US. Um, it's like a ticketing service. They offer, and again, what Stefan said before, this is great you know, to personalize things, but we want to go one step before that. You want to, from the moment the user comes to your page, we strongly believe that it's beneficial to the company to understand right from the beginning that he's this particular user, and the easiest way to do that is by signing them in, right? If they're already on Gmail, if they're already on YouTube, they'll be automatically be signed in the next time they come to your page. So you give them the option, sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. I mean, we don't mind, because we, we found that a lot of people, you know, trust Google pretty much because they have a Gmail account already. Um, once you click on this, you will see this consent button, which is a very normal, you, you've probably seen this also for Facebook Connect. It's like, yeah, know your name, basic info, gender, et cetera, demographics, and your picture. So you can customize the experience. Um, you can then, underneath, you can actually decide, do you want to share the activities you do there with some of your friends, yes or no? Or you just say, and this is really important here, I want to just have it, uh, I just want to experience it by myself, so just click the only you button. And I can't stress this point more, more enough because when we spoke to all these 47 companies, it was much more about user control than anything and trust of the user than actually try to tie them into something which they might not want to do, right? This kind of social sharing piece. Um, I talked to a company before downstairs and uh, they told me about, I, I told them about the identity sharing and how important that could be for your company to, you know, uh, get these identities from users, but not necessarily have them share things socially. And the guy said, well, but we want them to socially share things on our website. I think that's the wrong question to ask in the first place. Give the user the control and gain their trust. And only afterwards you can just ask them, do you want to socially share it? Yes or no? Make it from the first moment on visible that they are able to share or not share. It's their option, right? Um, the second piece we do, and this is very much uh, one thing which no one else can do, and this is the Android integration here, is once you say accept, yeah, I want to actually share my credentials, my Google credentials on this Fandango site, the second pop-up window here is coming from the Play Store. Because what we can do in Google is, whenever someone sets up an Android phone, you will be asked to get a Google account with it. This, the first thing you do on an Android phone is set up a Google account. Once you sign into Fandango here on the website, we can make a connection in the back end and understand that you guys might have a Nexus 4 device or an LGE Galaxy or whatever, whatever it is, a Galaxy Samsung, for instance, in your, at your disposal. So we ask you here, coming from the Play Store, we realize that there's a Fandango Movies app in the Play Store. Do you want to install this on your Nexus 4 device? And you click Install. And the moment you click Install, it will actually automatically up download onto your mobile phone, or your tablet for that matter. Which, again, a very, very important point here to highlight. If you are interested as a company to get more people from the web website, from the desktop version, driving towards your mobile experience, this is, this is killer. This is, this is the number one slide which I showed these other companies, these 47 companies, and they all said, this is amazing, how can we get this? When can we start doing this? Because they are interested in getting exactly this traction. They don't want the user to go to the Play Store, find, going through the search, which by the way is not very good on Google Play right now, um, surprising even though we're Google, but they don't want them to go through this hassle in order to find the app. This is when they pick, it up, pick them up when it's most relevant to them. And across everybody we implemented across the world, 40% of people actually accepting this Android installments. Again, a huge number, four out of 10 people are saying, I want to actually have this implemented on my phone. Next piece, next to this Android piece, um, 
Engage uses a cross device. As I said before, you are siloed today when you distract someone most of the times, right? You, you don't know that this is, particular, this is a particular user who came from the website and now it's actually on my mobile phone. So you want to have one identity across. The single sign-on lets you do this, allows you to actually understand that this user was before on the laptop, was uh, then going to the mobile phone or to the tablet device afterwards. And then you can target them and retarget them much, much more precisely and better and don't get on their nerves. Uh, very quick example, open table here. You go to the mobile phone. You say, hey, I want to sign with Google because I trust Google here. Um, you book your reservation on open table. Then, then you actually switch out of it. You come back to the desktop version of open table and you see on the right hand side that Christian is being identified on the desktop version and that he actually still has his booking which he did before on the mobile device. Make sense? I hope. Um, and the third piece, which is related to Google products, um, I mentioned that we want to tie in more deeply how you guys are going to be discovered on everything across Google. Google search, we worked, around, we worked with SoundCloud, we worked with some other music companies here. And what we do now, we provide a particular section on the right-hand side where it says popular with Google Plus users. This is super powerful for them. When someone is searching on Google search, now you see on the right-hand side what sort of relevant music songs were actually now listened to by Google Plus users on the soundcloud.com page. So for SoundCloud, a super interesting point to actually get more traction with users and get discoverability in the moment where hundreds of millions of users are right away. Um, okay, just to close off, just the partner success stories. I mean, you know, there are a lot of them, but it's, I think we have to sometimes show those numbers because they're so important. So 35% of people using Flickster, and you have, by the way, the option here again, sign with Facebook, sign with Google. Most, po third, most popular third-party sign-in method, Facebook, uh, Google+. Plus. Uh, not Facebook, not Facebook. Even though Facebook is great. It's great for social sharing. Um, but yeah, so you can actually see that people do actually take this into account. Snippet, number one um, fashion retailing app in the US. Millions of users. Ever since they implemented Google Plus sign-in, they have an uplift of 16% users signing up on it, which is a clear indicator for everybody who's doing this or had done it before with Facebook Connect or Twitter or whatever it is, or Amazon or so on. Um, is a clear indication for you that sometimes you don't pick up the whole market because the whole market might be some people in there who don't want to actually sign in with a Facebook Connect because they're wary of it. They don't know exactly what they're getting into. Maybe they're going to be something streaming on my, on, uh, on, my, on my live stream on Google and Facebook, right? We don't want to do that. We just want to give the user the control that they understand that they're not getting into something they don't want to share. So missing out on a fraction or like a big portion probably of the market is 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 here key for for Snapchat. The Guardian, well respected company, probably the number one leading newspaper in in, U, in the UK. Uh, Forty-one percent of their users. Again, you see the big different buttons here: Facebook, Google, Twitter, and Guardian on the Android phone. Forty-one percent of them actually signing with uh, with Google Plus. Reason because. The guys on Android already have a sign-in. I mean, they already have a Google account. It's, there's, there's an easy, easy leverage to say, oh, wait, I just already have that. I can very well use it already. So to sum it up, start with Android. If, if I would be any, I mean, how many companies are here? Show of hands. Is, are there companies in here or only VCs? Companies? Yes, perfect. Love it. So fantastic. All of you, if I would be you, I would, the most straightforward case to start off and if you're a B2C company, this would be for you. Or if you're working with companies on the B2C level, this is, start with Android, it's the most straightforward, easiest sell ever to say, there are Google users already. They will be probably likely using the Google domain or Google uh, credentials to sign up on Android. Start signing up on it. Use developers.google.com slash plus. We have kick-ass documentation in there. And if you're really keen, um, you can talk to me because I have developers in my team who work with some companies to actually get this onboarded. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Hey, good afternoon. So, thanks guys, thanks Intelligence for having us. Um, we're a video on demand portal here in Europe, probably 
the biggest one for movies and TV shows, free on the on the internet. We're one of the top <clears throat> 20 sites, 20 video properties uh, in the UK, US, Australia. One of the top 50 uh, websites in Germany. Um, 12,000 titles. Uh, we're across all devices pre-installed by the connected TV manufacturers. iOS, Android is obvious. Um, we make money with, uh, with advertising. And I want to talk about today how to make money with online video. Everyone talks about online video. Uh, we're deep, deep in it. Um, and I want to share some insights. First of all, why? Um, obvious, the young audience is moving away from free TV. Um, they're moving online. They're moving uh, to the multitude of devices, uh, mainly tablets, uh, web. And the market is growing fast. TV advertising is 120 billion globally. And a good portion, although a small portion, only 4% have moved into online video inventory. And believe it or not, there's a programmatic buying going on. Everyone was really scared of it. But what's happened is the CPMs have increased rather than decreased through that. Um, at the same time, another good market dynamic, traffic costs are coming down. And uh, it doesn't look like that's going to change. Uh, net neutrality is going to stay, at least for sure, in the, in the EU. So this makes a good backdrop for making money with professional video online, monetizing it with video advertising. But how do you do it? Um, first of all, here's what makes it hard. Um, it's not an internet business model where the content generates itself. We still need to license content in. Uh, we need to get it ready for the platforms. It needs to be encoded, encrypted. Uh, we need to get it editorially there because we need to manage the meta metadata. Uh, we never get everything perfectly. Uh, we need very frequent refreshes. Um, so this is not very internet style. It's sort of the, I would call it the, the sausage factory behind the scenes. And, um, <clears throat> And audiences are obviously also fickle. You've got uh, pirate platforms in the marketplace. Uh, you're competing with, there's YouTube, um, who are a huge audience magnet. So that's the, that's the downsides, or that's the, the tricky parts uh, that, that we're facing every day. Um, but nonetheless, obviously, you can make money. And how do you do that? Uh, I think there's, there's different options. There's the options. You start from scratch and you build a premium content experience, probably about one video vertical. And if you want to succeed, you need to make it a deeply social experience um, because you want to attract users back to you um, and you want many unique users. Or what we've discovered right at the other end of the spectrum is once you're in this business, once you've done all the hard work and the heavy lifting, um, the whole game is not about bringing every unique user to your website. It's about having as many unique users as possible for the advertisers, because with programmatic buying, you just need diversity. You need uh, a lot of unique users at any given point in time. You need scale. And how do you get that? Not necessarily all on your own website. You can get it through syndication. and. <clears throat> Today, half of our business is actually off our website. It's syndicated. And we have several products in syndication. It can be if you're deeply in the entertainment industry with your website, um, like the companies we saw earlier, uh, Fandango or Flixster. Uh, you can get a full video shop for movies and TV series in a box from us. Um, and if you're just a general website, with a lot of traffic, but you're not monetizing so well. Uh, there's syndication products that focus more on the video advertising, a little less on long-form content uh, that we can implement, um, relatively easy to implement. It's all about 
to be to be perfectly honest, it's about demand for video advertising outstripping supply of quality video views. So there's um, you've got an industry getting creative because there's not enough quality inventory around on the premium video sites um, that a multitude of products is coming into the market around syndication. So we have different content flavors, different player sizes. Um, they all attract slightly different CPMs, but basically that's, uh, if you're not in this game and you want to make money from online video, that's how to do it. <clears throat> so how does the revenue stream of, of programmatic buying work? Um, we are saying, or we are finding really, uh, that it's not something you need to worry about because there's a host of companies behind the scenes worrying about it for you. Essentially, um, you don't need first party data. If you have it, that's great, but if you don't have it, your advertisers and the companies they use as ad servers are going to do the targeting for you. Those are real-time decisions that you don't uh, even realize are happening, but there's real-time decision-making processes going on where this particular user at this particular point in time in this particular location will receive an ad, whereas the next guy will either not even receive one or receive another one, and the whole game comes down to having a large enough audience to offer up to these programmatic DSPs, SSPs. <clears throat> and obviously there's, um, there's behind the scenes uh, for the advertisers, there's a couple of KPIs you have to hit, um, and unless you hit those, you're really not part of the game. I would almost call them hygiene factors. Um, first of all, they've got to vet your player, your site, your content to say yes, you're allowed to, to play the game. And then there's KPIs, um, is your player and is your impression viewable? Is it human, so is it not a robot? That's, very, that's obviously super important. What's the view through rate of the advertising? What's the click through rate? And if you hit those KPIs and literally all of them, um, you're one of the players that can participate. And for us, on our website, obviously we're hitting them we're making sure that in our syndication network, uh, we pick the right partners who can help us hit the KPIs in syndication. They're slightly different. Uh, the click-through rate, for example, will be, will be a little lower, but therefore prices are also a little lower. And that's already it. Um, if, if you've got an interest in, in talking about online video, um, uh, I guess this is a small audience. Talk to me after this. Thank you. So thank you very much. I think we are at a bit over time and also at the end, and I think half of the people nearly sleeping because it's so dark. <laughs> it became in the meantime. Um, thank you very much. So um, the speakers are still here. We have a booth also downstairs for intelligence, so happy to answer the questions. Thank you.